Hey, I'm Pascal from Orange Pixel, and this is part three of the new Tech Talk series where we dive into source code of commercially released games. In this case, it's my channel, so these are also my games. Last week, I dove into Heroes of Loot, which is a game that was written a decade ago. Um, it has undergone different versions. It started out on my own framework, then I moved it all over to another framework, and then I actually ported it all over and changed it so that it was also uh, compatible with PCs because originally it was for mobile. So the code base was messy and I got a bunch of comments on that and uh, feedback on that. And uh, I should be ashamed of such programming code. Somebody responded like that, but the comment is gone. So I can't really show it. Anyway, um, I agree. I actually mentioned that in the video that a bunch of stuff in that game code should have been done a lot better and different. Uh, but I also disagree because uh, they can teach you a bunch of things at school and when you're learning how to program and in let's say five to ten years time they will be teaching completely different methods and technology and ideas and concepts to the new class of game developers. That doesn't mean um, all the other ideas are bad or wrong. So in the 90s we would all jumped on object-oriented programming these days um, especially for games you can still do it but don't go too far into that because it kind of slows down your game having to traverse all these objects in memory and jumping everything um, there is a bunch of examples there so um, of course my game code can be done better this was a decade old game it started on my own framework i then ported it to libgdx a completely different framework uh, then a couple of years later i completely changed it so that it was compatible with game pads and pcs and consoles and um, the game is still being sold, it's still alive, it's still getting updated for new devices. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how we get to such messy code in a game. So um, that's going to be the first part of this video and then we'll dive into a little bit of code from one of my games. So how do we actually end up with such messy code? Um, if game development is your day job, for me it is, and you have to push out a lot of games because you're not making those huge million selling or million dollar hits, then as soon as you release a game and you push it out there, you're gonna start on the next game and it has to be up and running pretty quickly because you can't waste too much time prototyping ideas that don't work. So the prototyping stage is uh, for me one or two weeks time and then I want my idea, my vision, my, my idea or concept of the gameplay up and running on the screen. That means all my focus is on creating the extremely important elements for that gameplay or whatever the thing I'm trying to create. Sometimes it's a feeling, sometimes it's a setting, a vibe or just the gameplay fun. All that stuff is important and the code that makes it happen isn't really important at all. We just want to see if it's fun because if it's not fun after two weeks, that's two weeks of wasted time and we need to start something else. If it is fun, we're gonna be just building on that code we just created. And of course, in your head, you always think, I'll get back to this later and I'll fix it and make it better and improve it and we'll do that later. Later never comes because you'll be adding more stuff onto it. You're changing things, you're bolting on new ideas, you're moving stuff, you're removing stuff. Code will become messy, no matter what your teachers told you. So if you ever followed a game development class and teachers told you how to do it and what the best way is, it never ends up that way. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but um, it's gonna be messy. At some point, your code will be messy. You'll have everything split out into tiny functions, and then one thing or one idea is added as game design idea, and um, that little function, we could perhaps give it an extra variable in just that case where a certain thing happens. And then next time you'll do it again and again, and before you know it, your code is messy and of course you can uh, complain about it you can look at it as a game developer and think why are you doing it like this doesn't matter the end result is there the game runs games i'm showing you in these tech talk series they're selling they're 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 actually doing what they should do and there are very little bugs in my games and for these tech talk series i'm also not preparing anything i'm just opening the code base recording that whole process and uh, some of these games, like I said, Heroes of Loot last week was uh, 10 years old, Gunsluck before that is 11 years old, and I can still find my way around this code base after not looking at it for a decade. So um, it might not be the cleanest and the most beautiful code, but it still all makes sense and it actually works and runs the game. And that's also part of the reason I'm doing these Tech Talk series. Um, I noticed a lot of beginning game developers or unexperienced game developers often have very basic questions or are questioning themselves on 
should I be doing it like this or is there a better way or a more experienced advanced way so i'll show you how i do it and it doesn't mean it's the best way or the only way or the most perfect way but it's a way and that's probably the thing you should be learning from these videos um the end result is important if you're writing code and of course you have to make sure it's, it's as buckless as possible and fail safe as possible but that's something you learn over time and nobody can teach you they can teach you all these terms and terminologies and, and whatever you'll have to structure code and figure out what works for you so um learn from these games learn how not to do it even that's a good lesson um, if that's the lesson you're going to take from these videos but um i hope you'll actually take some lessons from these videos so let's dive into the game of this week and um, i'll pick something more new than the last couple of episodes i'll dive into a third questionnaire it's a very tiny game it's a completely weird game compared to everything else i created I think it's a very unique game there's nothing like it as far as i know so um let's dive in there and see if there's anything interesting we can uh, pick out and maybe you can comment and remark how terribly i did it so uh, let's dive into it all right um what we see here is a uh, sir questionnaire and again check the previous videos all my games are pretty much based and built in the same way based on the same core and the same type of code and classes so uh, a lot of stuff is explained in previous videos uh, what we have here is the ai and we now have a base entity sprite which is what i'm using in my modern games my more current games this has all the properties almost every entity in a game needs and of course it has certain properties not all the entities need like uh, always on or uh, all these values of moving from one position to the next not everything needs those variables but it's good to have them all there in a base class and then pretty much um, what i talked about in previous games the entities for special effects monsters and the players they're all based on this new entity class and it will also handle all the stuff for um, cloning colliding with other entities colliding with certain rectangles or with just a sprite entity which is a, a lesser version of an entity it's just the visual appearance of that entity and not every other information required so just a lot of little methods that can be used by entities to quickly check stuff and interact with other stuff so um that's pretty much the entity sprite and all entities in my current games are based on something like this or a version of this so for this game there's not a lot of stuff happening in the entity types um, it's just a lot of different different type of entities and um, they all do pretty much the same because they're mostly just standing there animating and waiting for the player to interact with them because it's also a turn-based game so these things don't really do much by themselves they will just uh, stand there wait for the player to act and then they act or react to that and as you can see most types here do exactly the same code uh, waiting idling and then um, animating if they're stunned they will show a different animation and um, like i said it's pretty much easy and again this and this whole if else if else that you could do this in a switch statement in the end it doesn't really matter that much and i noticed i'm now excusing myself for everything i'm showing and that should not be an issue so i'm trying to block that out of my head because um, this all ran and the game did pretty well commercially so i should not be uh, worried about how it was coded it, it, it was a very uh, the game idea came to me literally in a dream or i woke up with it and just had this idea in my head and that's pretty much um, unchanged for the release game so in all all the time i worked on it i think it was three or four months pretty quickly as well it, it's a tiny interesting game and it just had a bunch of extra content this game was built on content so really most of the work for sir questionnaire has been on all these graphics um, there has been a lot of graphic creation and this is all in one big texture um, all the animations and then um, for all the items all the creatures all the entities all the monsters all the big bosses all the big stuff most of my work for this game was pretty much coming up with um, interesting ideas and content and creating it there's a lot of interface screens for this game and that's all split into different classes at uh, the backpack if you're completed a mission or a quest in one game the next game you'll be able to pick a backpack that's what this screen is uh, initializing the screen and then rendering the screen and handling the interaction with the player and um 
all pretty simple and we have a bunch of those things we have the codex which shows all the items all the creatures that you photographed in a little book um, again initialization and the rendering or well a couple of more initialization things here and there and uh, rendering it on the screen and again handling all the interaction all split up into different classes so, uh, the settings menu is up here and um, it all comes down to pretty much the same thing initializing it rendering it handling interaction with the player and finally the globals file like in every game i make uh, this file contains a bunch of variables a bunch of constants a bunch of information or version names and everything that the game uh, needs to access from everywhere else so from all the interface or all the entity elements most of the global stuff is in this file it always starts out as a very tiny file with a couple of things in there and then it usually grows to a huge file with a bunch of data but you could decide to put all this in a special data file and that makes it a lot easier to modify things later on or have um, other people modifying it or players modifying it but uh, this is all also very easy to implement later on you can just uh, dump all this to a text file or an xml file or whatever json file and then load it in but uh, when i'm programming it it's a lot easier to quickly add a little line here and this is usually i come up with an idea give it a name give it the information and i'm done with this um, so that's why i this grows very quickly you start with one item and then before you know it there's a bunch of items there and uh, that's what we do for all the global information and variables for the whole game and then of course finally we have the my canvas which is the base of this whole game and where everything starts and initializes um, nothing different from the previous games I covered so um, initialize the entities initialize uh, game pads and input uh, load all the graphics and funny thing here and uh, this is what I've been doing with a bunch of my games um, you never know if a game is gonna sell well or not if it's gonna be doing well or not so I often create a little alternate version and um, let me show so this is the Sir questionnaire version but we also have a bunch of images that could have potentially turned this game into a more sci-fi setting. Um, that was just an alternate idea. Let's say the game does very terrible or poorly or badly. You can't re-release it, but you can reskin it and modify it and release it as a completely different game. So the Sir Questionnaire here has a sort of space helmet on. And this is the version of Sir Questionnaire. And then this is the sci-fi version. And that's how I was already working on new graphics. Uh, the gates are here, space gates, and here they are old fashioned dungeon gates. I have done this for multiple games, but I never released this because Sir Questionnaire did well. And I also was kind of done with that game at that point. It's still a possibility that at some point we'll have Sir Questionnaire in space or something like that. Um, anything else of interest for this game? Anything special? All right, um, generate our wiki. This is something that I've started doing in the last couple of games. What this does is pretty much dump everything you see here in the globals and, and all the information we have in the game um, to a couple of text files. Those text files I then use uh, to create our little wiki page over here on the Orange Pixel website. We now have a couple of wikis. So for Sir Questionnaire, this wiki, uh, the characters, the rooms, the monsters, the items, Everything you see here, all these graphics, all these information, this all comes from uh, a couple of functions I implemented and all comes from the code. So here we just dump all that information into a couple of pages and that's how I quickly end up with a wiki. Um, I still have to do it for a couple of my older games, but it's a lot easier if I start doing that from the start and not have to do it for very old games where I have to figure out where everything is. Uh, this one, I pretty much build it as soon as the game got released so I knew how to extract all that information and uh, just dump it into one big wiki. So um, that's an interesting little uh, function. I've been adding it to a couple of my games. Space Guns 2 has it and I'll probably do it for residual as well. So um, that's an interesting one and anything. All right. Um, this is also something I worked on. There was a little uh, Twitch version of the game. Just something I was tinkering with. You could actually control the game um, 
in the Twitch chat and then the viewers could actually vote on the action, uh, go either uh, interact with this creature or leave the room. Players had a say in what was happening. So I, I programmed a bunch of Twitch integration. I never released it, never did much with it because uh, I don't know. It was fun to tinker with, but I think it was also a waste of time for that you need a huge Twitch streamer to actually pick up this game and give it a try. If you don't have that, you're pretty much wasting all that time on finding interesting Twitch integration. But it's good to now have some code here. It's still there because if I ever decide to integrate Twitch into any of my other games, this should be a good base to um, figure out how I actually did that. So um, yeah, it's a small tiny game and um, for Heroes of Loot I put it in the title how much it sold and I also had to defend myself on that fact. So I'm not going to tell you how much this game sold but um, it got an Apple of the Day feature when that actually was still an interesting thing to have. So it pretty much made uh, the development time back as soon as it got that Today feature. Of course you can't bet on having a feature for your game but um, a tiny game but it did very well short development cycle and it was easily made back and it's still selling I'm still thinking about pushing this to maybe the switch um, I think it could work on that game just having left right options um, it's something different something interesting and it's still a very unique concept I have never seen a game like it so um, maybe you'll see it on the Nintendo switch sometime soon um, don't know yet but um that's it for this week's video if you have any specific ideas or uh, want to know about certain things or how to do certain things let me know in the comments below uh, there are still um, I think two maybe three episodes of this tech talk series so uh, I can still cover a bunch of topics and interesting things just let me know if there's something specific you like to hear about and um, that's it for this week's video Thursday we'll talk about residual uh, just a normal devlog not too in-depth not too boring on the code front just um, a lot of interesting stuff happening with residual so I'll see you on Thursday. All right, bye.